morning, everybody. Can you hear me? I'm back. Okay. Yes. Okay, my name is uh, Daryl Lutton. I'm a, a botanist at the newly emerging Oman Botanic Garden. Uh, this is my second uh, SEB meeting. I was at Frostburg last year and uh, it was uh, equally enjoyable. So I'd like to thank the organizers before I start for all the, the excellent facilities and uh, the good people that have been here. Um, I want to talk today about a small pilot project that one of the staff members at Oman Botanic Gardens has commenced a couple of months ago as a part of a subset of the overall ethnobotanical work that we're trying to develop in the garden. Um, it's important to note that at this stage the garden is very, very uh, young and the staff are equally young and quite often very inexperienced. So part of this uh, project here is as much about training the staff in data collection, data management, interviewing techniques and so forth. They really have very, very little experience in this. Um, so results at this point um, are not the end goal of this uh, idea. The, the notion of doing this is completely alien to most of the Omani staff members that I work with, so it's very, very important. This is uh, Thorea Al Jabri. Um, she's a, a, an Omani, uh, comes from the city of uh, Muscat, the capital, and she is one of the Botany team members. Most of the Botany staff are graduates, um, and Thorea is one of those. You can see here before we start this brown dye on the hand, this is uh, henna, which is very, very important in this part of the world. It's a, it's a decorative ceremonial um, extract from the plant uh, Lawsonia inermis, and you will see some very, very detailed, very beautiful designs on many of the ladies' hands and arms um, during the times of, of weddings and so forth. So <clears throat> it's a very, very important plant of this area. So I, mean, well, I want to give a bit of background quickly on where Oman is, a little bit of history on the, on the culture, because I think it's important for people to have some idea of where it is. It's, it's a very, very unknown country from my experience. Quite often people don't know where it is, um, and where, when they do, they assume it's purely sand, desert, um, and I'd like to dispel some of those uh, preconceptions. So you can see here it's located on the Arabian Peninsula, on the southeast, um, and in finer detail here, you see uh, Yemen to the south, uh, Arabia here, which is, consumes most of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, Iran, and India is over there on this side, towards the east. This is the northern part of Oman, and the capital city, Muscat, is located in this area here. These are the Al Hajar Mountains, reaching the highest points in this area at about 3,000 meters. Um, the areas that we're looking at in this study are within Muscat and some of the surrounding areas within maybe an hour, an hour and a half drive from the city centre. Um, just to give you a bit of a, an idea about the landscape, it is, there is certainly sand desert in Oman. The centre of Oman in the Wahiba Sands is about 10,000 square kilometres of, of pure sand. Right into the west of Oman in Saudi Arabia, Arabia, you have the Rub al Khali Desert, which covers an area about twice the size of France. Um, it's absolutely vast, pure sand, very, very few species there, though there are some plant species. Um, the coastline is about 1,700 kilometers long. Um, it's very, very diverse in, in, in uh, fish species, very, very popular for, for divers internationally. Uh, I must apologize, anybody who was at SEED last year and was at this presentation, some of these introductory slides will be familiar, but like I say, it's important for those who, who don't know anything about Oman. Um, you have these. Uh, wadis, which are basically uh, river channels, they can be dry, um, they can be temporarily flooded, or they can be per have permanent pools like this. This one here is usually quite dry, but after the rains, uh, it can contain water up to maybe a meter deep for maybe two months or six weeks. Uh, but more often than not, the landscape is very, very dry. Rainfall uh, on average is less than 100 millimeters a year. So it's very, very dry. In some areas, you may not get rain for two or three years. Um, so it makes living conditions and the conditions for plants very, very extreme. This is the eastern Hajar Mountains, which is the lower, southern eastern range of that mountain range I showed you on the original map. Um, okay, here's Sand Desert, which is probably what most people consider to be the dominant landscape in Arabia. It is, it is important, but it's certainly not the dominant landscape in Oman. This area here is a place called, in a, an area in the very south of Oman called Dofar. And during this time of year, 
for about three or four months. The Indian monsoon extends right over and touches off the mountains in Dokar and basically clouds the entire mountain range along the coast in, in thick cloud, which <coughs> produces a lot of precipitation, greening the area for about four months. By the end of September or so, um, the sun has come out and it's doing its work again and the place becomes extremely dry. But this area um, has a huge amount of endemics, plant endemics. Uh, it's a lot of very unusual mammals and birds. It's a highly diverse place, uh, particularly in the context of Arabia. Um, cultural life, um, this is the, the Corniche, the seafront and the mosque in the capital. You see the dominant uh, minaret here of the mosque, so Islam is very, very important. Um, and it, it is absolutely dominant everywhere. The traditional buildings here are scattered throughout the, the city. The city is not like Dubai or Abu Dhabi. It has very, there is no high rise buildings, nothing very flash. It is far more traditional and, in my opinion, a much nicer place to be. Markets are absolutely everywhere. Traditional food markets, medicinal markets, and so forth are actually found all over the place. Um, men sitting around drinking tea and talking is very, very, very important. It's very, very common. Um, kids playing on the beaches. It's a very, very relaxed society, very enjoyable society to do. Uh, traditional practices from basketry, making dyes, uh, clothes, production of uh, medicinal plants and so forth, is still very common. There is a very, very long history of this kind of thing in that part of the world. And in Oman, um, it's to be found everywhere. Even in the big city, you will find people uh, working in stalls. Particularly here, these, uh, these are Bedouin ladies, recognized here by the type of face mask they're wearing which is very traditional in the Bedouin culture, which is somewhat different to the uh, Omani culture. <coughs> and again, more examples of, of basketry, and uh, guys making nets from, from local material. Okay, so when you leave the cities in the mountains, this is a village called Balatsit, and it's about uh, 1,800 meters above sea level. And there are many of these villages scattered throughout the mountains in the, in the north. In the south, there's also villages like this, but not as detailed and not as intricate. They survive here generally on uh, agriculture. You see these very, very detailed uh, agricultural terraces, and these are dotted right the way throughout the, the mountains, and they're, they're very, very productive and an absolute lifeline for the local people. And within these areas here, many crops are grown for medicinal use, uh, but mostly you're finding wheat and barley. Some of the mountain areas you find fruit trees, like pomegranate, for example, up in the cooler, high altitudes. Um, these examples here of fields. This is, this is in an area which is getting an absolutely tiny amount of rain, annual rain, but yet they manage to capture water in a very clever way um, to ensure that their crops are uh, abundant each year. This is the type of system. Each field is, uh, can be a large plot like this or divide, subdivided into smaller plots for maybe growing garlic or onion and so forth. Um, here's an example of terraces. These are hundreds, if not thousands, of years old. These are all full of wheat at the moment. And in the, in the foreground here, this is uh, aloe vera. And again, we know that the properties, the many medicinal properties of aloe vera. This is the system that's used throughout the, the region for irrigating fields. And this is called the alphalage system. Um, it's either fed by springs or directly by the rainwater. So when it rains in the mountains, they are, there are channels built. This is a more modern channel made from uh, modern cement. But the, the old channels dating back thousands of years are literally carved out into the mountains. And they bring water from any point in the mountain to reservoirs, usually um, uphill from the village. And water is stored there um, and is released down these channels into all the fields that we saw. And there is a person in each village who is responsible for the distribution and even distribution of the water. So if you have let's say 30 square meters of field, you're entitled to, uh, let's say, two hours of water per week. And that person that will open up with a little valve, allow you to have your irrigation for two hours, will close the valve, and the next person then will get there and water. It, it, it ensures an even distribution of water, and ensures that everybody gets an equal chance to grow the crops. Most crops are used to feed the village, though some excess are sold at local markets, are bartered with, with other villages. So that's the background on the country. The ethnobotanical work um, we're doing at Oman Botanic Garden is, again, at the very, very early stages. There is a vast amount of information, uh, a vast amount of experience in Oman with ethnobotanical practices, ranging from um, 
craft to medicinal plants. And we, what, we are, what we're trying to do is literally beginning at the local, in the local radius from the garden, is to visit villages and simply start making lists of the species, collecting better specimens. Oh, really? oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we want to collect these better specimens, um, collect all of the data, collect the languages, what's, what's the Arabic name, the local names, these are different languages throughout Oman, what parts are used, how they're used, what they use for, and so forth. So this is something that we're, we're, we're slowly doing. The team are gaining great experience with this. Um, in many instances, we're carrying out um, audio interviews, video interviews, and we're databasing all of this, and it's becoming a very, very rapidly becoming a very big archive. Um, okay, so the, quick, the use of medicinal plants in Oman, as, as based on the literature so far, we're about 1,200 taxa in Oman. So this is growing with our field trips. We're finding new species new subspecies uh, on a regular basis. Shahini um, Gazanfar um, recorded 56 uh, plants of medicinal value, medicinal use in the north of Oman. Miller and Morris, from their uh, fantastic book, um, 146 species from southern Oman. Um, we have added in our work so far an extra 64 taxa, mainly in the north of Oman. But I'm sure this will be far higher once we get um, actually get some momentum. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. This is the type of medicine, traditional medicine practice in Oman in the region. Uh, Unani Tib, or Unani Tib, sometimes spelled with Y, is basically a Greek medicine, and that's very common throughout the region. Some of the plants used, Rhizo um, uh, Stricta, this has important uses um, for religious reasons as well. It keeps away this evil spirit, this jinn spirit, that is very uh, common in, in belief along the, the whole Arabian Peninsula. Uh, Allodophorensis, this is endemic from uh, southern Oman. Rosa Damasena from the north in the high mountains, this is grown. Rose water is very important. Uh, this here, uh, Carthanus, is used for conjunctivitis. Adenium obesum, a very beautiful succulent plant from the southern parts of Oman. Really stunning uh, species. Uh, juniper, this uh, endemic species in the north of Oman, again, is, is very, very uh, widely used. Um, though plants are seem, seem, plants at lower altitudes seem to be suffering a lot of um, uh, extirpation, with we don't know what the causes at the moment. Um, and of course, probably the most important uh, certain historic species for for income and economics in Oman was the frankincense, which is still very widely used. So the survey of medicinal plants, we have very little literature to go on. There's very little published data on ethnobotany or medicinal plants in Oman. The Plants of the Far, which is probably the seminal book for Omani uh, botany and uh, traditional uses. Um, this is a wider book that doesn't focus only on Oman, but the whole Arabian Peninsula. This is a government document um, which is used in the government medicinal clinics. They have catalogued uh, the plants that they sell in the clinics <coughs> and some academic papers that are outlining species lists, but it's not very extensive. So the background here. Um, Traditional use of medicine has diminished in recent years, as, as is the case in many parts of the world, though it is still practiced in the remote villages. Um, and what we want to do is to find out how much is practiced and what are they using. Um, so, this is sort of standard objectives here just to document the use of native and non native plants in the medicinal culture. Um, and use this ethnobotanical data to feed into our ethnobotanical education program at the garden, which will be a major part of the garden once it starts uh, running. So the methodology, we're targeting 10 uh, outlets within the Muscat area. Um, and we want to set up a series, have a series of questionnaires for the owners. We've, Thurea and two of the staff members have done this. This is all through Arabic. Many of these sellers don't speak uh, English, so, and it's also quite polite, I think, to, to do this through Arabic. So here's some of the here's Thurea and some of the markets. The markets vary in standard from sort of ramshackle places to much more organized. This is a government uh, medicinal outlet. Here's some of the products. Again, they vary in the, the quality and the packaging and so forth. This is Omani honey, collected from the mountains. Extremely tasty but very expensive. Um, what, what has come out immediately is that once we started this, that the guys who are running the markets did not want to cooperate. They, as soon as they found out other markets were starting to contribute, that they just stopped. And I think a lot of this is to do with competition. Maybe they don't want to give away the secrets. Anyway, we're going to have to review this 
and how we're and how we're approaching the question here because it simply will not answer questions um, which wasn't expected. Um, what we have found is that is that virtually all of the plants that are being sold in the markets are not on many. They're coming from uh, India, Pakistan, and so forth. So that was something we weren't expecting. Given the use of native plants for medicinal purposes in the villages, this was quite unexpected. So I'll quickly go to the last slide. Because of what we've come across, the fact that there was virtually no native plants being sold, we we, we had this notion that what well, the main reason they're not being sold by the government clinics is that the government clinics don't have the staff to go and collect native plants. They don't have the space to grow them. So they, therefore, they don't see it's it's not economically viable to them. So. What we're suggesting is, um, because our garden is under the same management as the uh, medicinal outlets, we're, we're trying to do a pilot project now. We'll start in the next few weeks. We're visiting one or two villages in these areas. We're going to try and get two of the farmers to grow as a trial some local medicinal plants and give them to them or sell them to the government markets as a, as, as a form of income for the farmer and a form of rehabilitation for these um, terraces that are falling apart and some of the mountains that are no longer used. So it's a long way from being complete, but we hope that um, this project, as well as training some of the staff, will allow us to maybe rehabilitate some of these old terraces by getting the farmers to grow medicinal plants for supply to the government. It, it may well work. Maybe at next year's meeting we can present or present something positive within this. So thank you for listening. Sorry for going over time. Thank you.